okay, so the best evidence, best evidence for evolution is it happens. And biodiversity and complexity increase naturally. We covered that in the last couple of programs. And I completely disagree with you, Mr. Nelson. No, you agreed that evolution happens. You've always accepted that microevolution happens, and you accept that speciation happens too, even though you don't realize that that crosses into macroevolution, which is part of the same theory. Whether it's small scale evolution or large scale evolution, there's still both evolution, obviously. So if you accept that either one happens, you accept that evolution happens, and as it happens, you accept both. At one point you said that evolution meant that everything else needed to die in order for any new variety to become dominant or more plentiful. But at other points, you contradicted yourself there and agreed that biodiversity does increase, and not at the expense of anything else. You even proved that yourself with a fair explanation of how humans engineered the mustard plant into six different plants. You said these weren't man-made, but then you explained exactly how man made them. Although these were produced by artificial selection, that uses the same mechanism as natural selection. You said that natural selection doesn't work, but then a moment later you accurately explained how it really does work. So you're either confused about that or you just enjoy contradicting yourself. You did seem to be confused about how a selection process was supposed to create the things it was supposed to select, which no one ever suggested. Darwin never abandoned natural selection, but he always knew that it could only select different options if there were a variety of options to select from. So the only disagreement you and I had was over where that variety comes from. You said that Evolution is based on two totally faulty assumptions. But it turns out you agree with at least one of them already. I mean, natural selection doesn't make anything survive, and it's rare that any trait takes over a population, at least not in the way you implied. So the faulty assumption is still yours. The reality is that mutations generate variations that might be affected by natural selection. You do agree with one of those two not-so-faulty premises, which you erroneously called assumptions, because neither one of them are assumptions. We have proof for both. You apparently even agreed with genetic drift, since you accept that more than 17,000 described species of butterflies all came from a common ancestor, because in their case, natural selection really is a conservative process that removes defective organisms because there is no difference between any of the many varieties of butterflies that is significant enough to improve viability or reproduction. So natural selection had no effect in where that staggering variety came from. You read on your screen that genes vary in natural populations, but you got that confused with Lamarckism because they showed how generic variation explained what Lamarck could not explain, being the giraffe, which was always Lamarck's favorite illustration. You can't just look at the pictures now, you gotta read the words too. I know that you know that Lamarck's idea was the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and you and I both agree on the reasons why that is wrong. But Darwin was the one who wrote about tiny variations being present in every batch of siblings. Lamarck didn't think of that. Darwin explained how these tiny variations could be cumulative if they offer a selective advantage, and you explained how you agreed with that too. Those tiny variations are the genes that vary in natural populations, and these still accumulate even if they're not selected for. Divide any population and isolate them into different groups, and you will see these differences building up between them. I know you accept this because I've seen you describing how this happens in ring species. As any one original species slowly winds around a geographic barrier like a mountain range or around a valley, uh, multiple varieties appear along the way as each of the new strains distance themselves from the ancestral gene pool. They may be interfertile with their neighboring deems, but once they complete that circle, the variance is built up to the point that it's too great to interbreed with the original ancestral species that started that ring. So they're no longer the same kind and can't bring forth after the kind they once were, because the information in their DNA is now new and different. So you know that these variations exist and that they build up over time, meaning that it is new information that could not have already been in their genome. So whether you're willing to admit this or not, you have to realize that mutations are the source of that new information, just like all the genetic studies done over the last several decades have all shown. 17,000 species of butterflies, some with brightly colored wings, some with clear transparent wings, some with different shapes and colors in their wings. Traits that were not present and are not evident in any one genome have to be the product of mutations building up in different groups that have moved on to new areas. You even agree that mutations happen and that they can be neutral, 
You don't even have to understand how some mutations can be beneficial as long as you accept that this is where that variance comes from. Thus far in this video, you and I agree almost completely that evolution does indeed happen. He said, my first fact and evidence in support of evolution, the fact that evolution happens, are not good, okay? Well, if we're going to propose an explanation of what happened, then we have to be able to show that whatever we propose is at least possible, right, before we go on to show whether it is probable to. So if I defend the origin of species by natural selection, then it's good if we both agree already that new species do evolve by natural selection, as well as genetic drift because this has been directly observed and documented and demonstrated both in the lab and throughout agriculture. So we know this much is true. And even if you still don't know that, I can show the proof. Anybody can. That's why so many Christians accept evolution as the method by which the earth brings forth different species after their kind. You, however, are arguing for a magical, uh, excuse me, supernatural, creation of living organism being poofed out of nothing by an incantation or a wish coming true. So I've shown you sufficient proof that evolution happens. Now you show me proof that anything was ever created or that anything even could be created like your religion says. Because if you can't show that what you propose is even possible, then it can't be an option to consider either. He said my second fact and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. What is that? Let's see, I'm going to play a few minutes, a full, a full minute of his speech. And then I'm going to go back and take it apart piece by piece, okay? So here goes the full minute. Did I get it? Yep. All right. Now to start it, I click here. My second fact in evidence in support of evolution Not is showing. taxonomy. There it is. Okay. That was the first indication of evolution and still the most compelling especially now that it's a twin nested hierarchy, where what had been determined by physical characteristics is now confirmed genetically. Because as the 18th century creationist who discovered it realized, it shows a relationship between all living things that contradicts creationism and that only evolution could eventually account for. Note that cladistic phylogenetic systematics is not drawing lines on paper like you made it out to be. Instead, it's enveloping categories based on diagnostic characteristics because evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. And these tiers of similarity establish taxonomic clades. For that reason, evolution adheres to the laws of monophyly and biodiversity. So there can never be a change between kinds and there's no such thing as a kind anyway. Because again, it is a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, etherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome animals. There's no faith required in any of this. We can prove it all. Now my third. Okay, before we get into his third, <laughs> sesquipedalian. How many agree that was a sesquipedalian speech? Okay, okay. So before we get into, this is why the, some of the commenters are complaining that I cut him off after a few words. We'll say, let him give his answer. Okay, that was the full one minute answer of his second proof for evolution. So I'm gonna go back now and go through line by line and explain if I can figure out how to alt tab right there. Did I get it? Okay. My second fact and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. Well, taxonomy is the branch of science concerned with classification. We do that in our shop. We put all the screws in one spot, the nails in one spot, the bolts in one spot, the wrenches in one spot. You classify things and organize them according to what they are. There's no sense having the quarter inch wrench next to the super glue. Okay, it would not make sense. Especially organisms, that is called systematics, getting a system of organizing things, taxonomy. Carolus Linnaeus is famous for his work in taxonomy, the science of identifying, naming, and classifying organisms, plants, bacteria, etc. He was born in 1707. Linnaeus' thoughts on evolution are very different from the modern day theories. He believed that species were immutable, means species can't change. Now he was wrong about this. He's, he would say if there are 30 different kinds of sparrows, then God made 30 different kinds of sparrows. He went overboard in that regard. God might have made two sparrows, and Noah might have had two sparrows on the ark, and they've now diversified to 30 varieties of sparrows. 
but they're still a sparrow. And a sparrow is still a dinosaur. I'll explain. There are 35 species of sparrow just in North America, but they're a family level taxon that is distributed globally. The passerid family, like the corvid family of ravens and crows and so on, are in the order passeriforms, which as you can see here are a sister clade to parrots and raptors, also known as birds of prey. Now, this is from the old Arizona Tree of Life project. I'd rather show screenshots from my own phylogeny explorer project, but that's intended primarily for scientists and is consequently much too detailed for the baby steps I have to illustrate for you and your followers in this debate. Collectively, these so-called land birds are all neo-aves, which is actually a larger clade shown here. I'm leaving out an awful lot in every category, just to keep it simple. But bear in mind that each of these clades consists of many different families, each with multiple genera divided into numerous species. So we're talking about quite a lot more birds here than it looks. Neo-aves are a sister clade to Gallo and Sari, which includes galliforms, which is the order of turkeys, chickens, and other gamefowl, and anseriforms, which is the order of ducks, geese, swans, and so on. And all of these, so far, are known as neonates, new birds, which is a sister clade to paleonates, primitive birds like emus, ostriches, kiwis, and tinamous. Now they're called primitive birds because they retain so many primitive traits that they still look like what we typically think of as dinosaurs. Neonates did not come from paleonates. They're both nested in the same parent clade, neorneaths, along with several clades of fossil birds that are even more primitive, like ichthyornis, hesperornis, enantiornis, confusisornis, and so on. Now some of these still have dinosaur features like teeth and long tails and grasping fingers in their wings until we come to things like Rahone avis, which looks more like a flying dinosaur than it does a bird. Notice the sickle claw like Deinonychus or Velociraptor has? That's because this is the same thing. Not just the claw, but the whole skeleton. This is a Velociraptor that flies. We now know that all Manoraptor and dinosaurs were fully feathered. This is how Disney depicted Oviraptor back in Y2K. But it actually looked more like this. And this is what Velociraptor really looked like, not those naked reptiles in Jurassic Park. That's why all aves are classified as a subset of Silurosaurus, itself a subset of theropod dinosaurs. Just as not all birds are ducks, but all ducks are birds, so it is true that not all dinosaurs are birds, but all birds are dinosaurs. In fact, there's a collection of non-avian dinosaurs called paraaves, most of which still have long tails, teeth, and wing fingers. They are still definitely dinosaurs, but they are so bird-like that any five-year-old would tell you, that's a bird. And grown-ups are just as confused. Look at Caudipteryx zooey, for example. Can you tell the difference? Which is it? Is this a bird or is this a dinosaur? Even the experts can't tell for sure, seriously. But they figured out that whether it is a bird or not, it's still definitely a dinosaur either way. So birds are a new kind of dinosaur. <coughs> but it's still a dinosaur, sir. It didn't turn into something else. Okay. So Carolus Linnaeus was one of the guys in the 1700s responsible for developing what we call today our classification system. He started organizing things in order with kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So man, for instance, is called Homo sapien. Homo is the genus, sapien is the species. And most animals, they call it a binomial, they give it two names. Instead of just saying it's a sapien, they say Homo sapien, so they give it a, name it after the genus and the species, so you know exactly what they're talking about. At this point I should mention that every genus typically includes multiple species, and our genus is no exception, with a few other human species that are now all extinct. One being Homo erectus a hugely diverse group with a wide range of body sizes and brain sizes. Their fossils have been found across Africa, Europe, and Asia dating from 1.89 million years ago to roughly 143,000 years ago. They were a much more varied species than we are, with some so different from each other as to trivialize and negate any notion of race within our own species. Whenever we find fossil groups like these, we usually classify them as sister species rather than our ancestors. We never say that any species is directly ancestral because there's usually no way to know, and there's always the possibility that we might find something even closer. However, this is probably the one time where we have so much data that we actually can say for certain that our species, Homo sapiens, and our older brother, Homo neanderthalensis, both definitely descend from Homo erectus. So, that's all Latin. Latin is a dead language 
it killed the Romans, and now it's killing us, trying to learn that. <clears throat> but variations in, within species and even creation of new species is possible and has been observed. That is science and is no problem for Bible believers who say that God clearly said they will always bring forth after their kind. Thank you for finally admitting that evolution, including macroevolution, the origin of species, really is observed science. Now where exactly is a kind compared to Carolus Linnaeus's classification system? I don't think it's the same spot in every instance, and it doesn't matter. See, God made the kinds before Carolus Linnaeus made his classification system. So God's, def I think the word kind is very descriptive. Why? Because it doesn't describe anything? Or because no one, including you, can even define what a kind is? At the very least, you should be able to point out where that mystic division is on a cladogram. That was the phylogeny challenge you failed to answer, remember? I mean, you did try to answer that, unwittingly, of course, since you couldn't understand what the challenge was. You were supposed to name two taxa, two examples that science considers to be closely related, but that you imagine to be different kinds. And unknowingly, you tried to divide dogs and bears, which are both caniforms, and you tried to separate butterflies from other obvious members of their same family. The point of the exercise was to illustrate how to know where that division is between created kinds that should not be part of any larger taxonomic category because they were created by God. You could not meet that challenge. No creationist can because there's no such thing as a kind. I think the four different varieties of elephants, African elephant, Asian elephant, a mammoth, and mastodon, are the same kind of animal, and a five-year-old will tell you that. But an adult would know better. Partly because proboscidea is a much bigger taxonomic family than you know. Let me give you a quick rundown on the evolution of the elephant. The base of their family tree is Moyotherium, which is strikingly similar to Pezosiren, which is a four-legged walking ancestor of manatees and dugongs. We have the complete fossil sequence for their lineage now. These two are at the base of Tethytheria, which includes both proboscidians and Sirenians. Anyway, Moyotherium apparently then turned the lower tusks, or the lower incisors, into tusks, becoming Chilotherium. And moving on, uh, we have the Oligocene Pheomia, with pronounced tusks above and below, starting to look like a semi-elephant, though I think even a five-year-old could still tell the difference. This Gomphotherium from about 20 million years ago represents the point in elephant evolution where both the upper and lower incisors grew to such proportions that, of course, the length of the nose had to increase right along with them and become more dexterous to make up for them. Now, these led to Tetralophodon, Trilophodon, Paleomastodon, and Platybelodon. The next really important stage of elephant evolution is when the lower incisors became tusks. And some of these didn't have such shovel-like teeth anymore. There was a space where the newly lengthened nose could slide between them so that now they could be considered a true trunk, as seen here on Stegotetrabelodon. Obviously, there came a point at which these absurdly mutated teeth had become useless for feeding, which forced them to use their already flexible noses to rake and trowel food into their mouths the same way that modern elephants still do today. Initially, both the top and bottom incisors grew out as well as the lower jaw. Uh, Dinotherium represents the point at which that trend came to an end, when the lower jaw sort of dropped off, so to speak, leaving one now very long nose, which was out there by itself like it is on modern elephants. In the last couple million years, every species that bore four tusks and elongated lower jaws eventually died off, leaving only dinotheres and the more familiar-looking twin-tusked proboscideans like stegodont, which of course led to mammoths and mastodons and two species of modern elephants. And you thought there were only four kinds of proboscideans and that they were all the elephant kind? That's cute. <clears throat> Probably so the kind indicates somewhere around the family or genus level. Everything above that is speculation. If you want to believe this proves this, you're crazy. In my humble, totally unbiased opinion. Is it speculation? that we belong to kingdom animalia? Because the definition of that clade is any multicellular organism with an internal digestive tract to ingest and digest other organisms in order to survive. If it describes you, it defines you. And that definition does describe humans, doesn't it? I mean, even your Bible says that humans are animals and that only our vanity would prevent us from recognizing or accepting this fact. Is it crazy to think that we are also in phylum chordata, meaning animals with a spinal cord? I mean, you do have a spinal cord, right? Is it just crazy speculation that you're also in class mammalia? Or can that be objectively proven that you're a warm-blooded chordate with hair follicles and mammary glands? 
You might object to being classified in the order of primates, but is it just speculation that you're a hind leg dominant mammal with opposable thumbs and forward facing binocular eyes and fully enclosed eye sockets? What about being in the family Hominoidea? Because that means humans and anything like humans. I mean, even you wouldn't argue that you're neither human nor like a human, right? Were any of the Linnaean ranks only speculation, like you said? Of course, there are several more layers now than Linnaeus knew about. I'm sure you can't argue that we're in the domain eukaryotes, since all our cells, including our blood cells, at least initially, have a nucleus. In my video on the systematic classification of life, I've listed some 50 named clades between what you would call molecules all the way to man. And there are several unnamed clades in there, too. So our taxonomy is quite a bit more in-depth and complex than you can imagine. So, Mr. Nelson said, my second fact and support and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. That was the first evidence of evolution and is still the most compelling. Whoa. <clears throat> the fact that we can organize animals by their certain characteristics is proof of evolution? I don't understand, Mr. Nelson. Okay, explain that in smaller words, please. I'd be happy to. If you describe what a eukaryote is, you describe people. Within that group, if you describe what an animal is, you describe people too. Within that group, the criteria to be a bilateral nephrozoan coelomate, or within those, a therapsid amniotic tetrapod, all describe people again. If you list all the diagnostic traits held in common by all monkeys without making special exceptions for certain ones, you describe people. And if you do the same thing to specify only old world monkeys, you describe people again. And within that set, if you list the diagnostic traits of all apes, again, you'll describe people. And if you specify great apes, you describe people again. Whereas, if you were to go to any other subgroup at any one of those levels, you'd describe something else. Okay. He said what had been determined by physical characteristics, in other words, they were classifying them by how they looked or physical characteristics. Could they fly? Did they crawl? You know, whatever. Did they have hair? Is now confirmed genetically. You're dreaming on both counts, Mr. Nelson. No, we've already confirmed that I am not dreaming on the first count on comparative morphology. Remember, Carolus Linnaeus himself challenged the scientific community of his day, saying, I demand of you and of the whole world that you show me a generic character, one that is according to the generally accepted principles of classification by which to distinguish between man and ape. I myself most assuredly know of none. I wish somebody would indicate one to me. But if I had called man an ape or vice versa, I would have fallen under the ban of all ecclesiastics. It may be that as a naturalist, I ought to have done so. Remember, this is the guy who did go on to classify chimpanzees and orangutans as a subset of humans. And I have plenty of genomic studies to confirm that I'm not dreaming on the second count either. Check out the molecular phylogeny of living primates as just one of several examples. You know, the Hindus say that our reality is only a dream of Brahma. Well, I think your reality comes from a somewhat lesser source. Perhaps it's time you woke up to experience what reality really is. He said because as the 18th century creationists who discovered it, they discovered you can classify animals, like people didn't know that before. <laughs> okay, as the 18th century creationists realized, and I'm just quoting word for word what he said, I typed it out, had to listen to it five times, you talk about painful. <sighs> it shows a relationship between all living things that contradicts creationism. Slow down, hold it, stop, beep, pause. How on earth does the fact that we can classify things contradict creationism? Because of the hierarchy of parent and daughter clades, like a set of Russian Matryoshka dolls, where each doll contains at least two more daughters, each with markers to prove which one belongs to which mother. What Linnaeus discovered was a branching tree pattern that is inconsistent with any notion of created kinds like you believe in, and instead can only be explained by evolutionary relationships. Though I'd be delighted to hear how you fail to address or account for any of this. He runs off at the mouth and says stuff like this and just bl blows right on by it as if now it's, it's a fact because he said it. No, that's what you do. Assert things on your own erroneously assumed authority. I don't say it unless it's a fact already. So if I said it, then you can check it and see it that it's a fact. But if you say it, then a moment on Google will show that you lied. See, the Bible says clearly they will bring forth after their kind. That's all I've ever seen. I think that's all any farmer in the world has ever seen. 
That's right, because one of the laws of evolution is the law of monophyly, meaning that nothing can ever grow out of its ancestry to turn into something its parents weren't, like you keep saying evolution would. How many have ever done any farming before? <coughs> we got several here, we're done for the farm, okay. Do you know of any exceptions to the idea that corn produces corn and cows produce cows and dogs produce dogs? Now you might get some screwball varieties like the chihuahua or what you but <clears throat> it's still a dog, barely, but it is still in the dog kind, okay? You're so stupid. And that only evolution could eventually account for. This is word for word from his sesquipedalian speech. Mr. Nelson, you are insane. I'm not the one who believes in imaginary friends with magic powers. And I'm not the one who believes that fairy tales are historical accounts. And I'm not the one saying that all the experts are wrong and that only uneducated, willfully ignorant idiots are right. But if you think you can explain this branching tree pattern, this intricate network of over 50 named clades just in our own phylogeny, not to mention that of millions of other species too, I'd like to hear it. I've already heard from the best of creationism's baromenologists lamenting their unrelenting failure here, and those are people who at least try to understand systematics. So let's see how poorly you do. Let's hear your explanation. And if you can't explain it because no creationist can, then will you be accountable and admit that evolution really is the only explanation that works and is consistent throughout without need of evoking miracles along the way? Because when you fail, as creationists always do, to offer any explanation other than appropriating evolution itself, will you have honor enough to admit that I'm not insane for accurately predicting your failure there? From everything I know about you, I don't think you even can admit when you're wrong. Lyle's the primary guy responsible for giving us what today we call the geologic column. Invented by Charlie Lyle, there's the three books right over there. He's the guy who gave most of the names to the layers, like Jurassic, <clears throat> movie Jurassic Park, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian after Devonshire, England. Most of them have names coming from some area that in France or England, okay? In the early 1800s, each layer was given a name, and it was given an age, and it was given an index fossil. All this was made up in the 1800s, way before there was carbon dating, potassium argon, rubidium strontium, lead 208, lead 206. None of those had been thought of. So don't tell me this thing was arranged by radiometric dating. It was made up by giving each fossil an age and assuming evolution was true. Now there's another lie. Now Charles Lyell had compared the amount of evolution shown by marine mollusks in the various series of the tertiary system with the amount that had occurred from the beginning of the Pleistocene, and he estimated about 80 million years for the Xenozoic era alone. He was off by 14 million years, but that's still a pretty good guess, considering that radiometric dating later confirmed the Cenozoic era covered a period of roughly 66 million years. So he didn't make it up like you said. You were wrong about that too, like everything else. And using other methods, like rates of sedimentation or salt deposition, other contemporaries, including Christians, estimated the age of the Earth to be anywhere from 100 million to 1.6 billion years old. Except for Lord Kelvin. Using the laws of thermodynamics, he determined the Earth to be in the range of 20 to 40 million years old, and he was one of the creationists, like you. Well, he wasn't like you. He was smart and wise enough to change his mind once radiometric dating was invented and used to prove that him and Lyle and all these other guys were wrong. So the ages of the geologic column were established by radiometric dating after all. But you got to admit, each of these guys was at least in the ballpark. I mean, nobody, not even Bible believers at that time, were arguing for a universe that was only a few thousand years old. Not if they knew the first thing about anything. So how do you explain numerous methods all returning dates in the millions of years and pretty close to the same numbers too, despite errors in the estimates? Why is your belief system so completely counter to everything any scientist, even scientific Christians, believe? Why does all the evidence from every field insist that it's in the range of millions of years except for your ignorant interpretation of a sacred fairy tale? Can you explain, in five words or less, what is the total flaw with your dogmatic belief system? The whole thing is baloney. Yeah. Even stacked like baloney. Okay. Uh, it's a fact the Earth has layers of rock. The evolutionist will say, well, the layers form slowly over millions of years. The Christian says, no, those layers are from the flood in the days of Noah. And these guys are always trying to erase that line and make you think their interpretation is also part of the fact. No, guys, it's a fact the Earth has layers. 
it is not a fact the layers form slowly over millions of years. Now you can preach that long and hard, and you do, and you will continue, I'm sure, but that's not a fact. Yes, it is, and there are numerous ways to prove that. Not just with several different overlapping types of radiometric dating, but also with several other methods of dating as well. The only thing contradicting the one and only universally concordant account given by consensus of every objective measure we can confirm is the false calculation of one doddering old idiot who could count but couldn't account for everything in your fables or in the real world either. And that's why your bishop Usher put Noah's flood at 2349 BCE, during the life of Sargon of Akkad, at the beginning of Egypt's sixth dynasty, after the death of Pharaoh Unas. So we know that Usher's calculation had a critical failure, meaning that his answer, your answer, is wrong. And if it's wrong about that date, it's got to be wrong about the other date, too. And that's why yours is the only timeline that doesn't match the one that absolutely everything else from anywhere else is pointing to. Okay. So the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. There's only one place you can actually find it. That's in the textbooks. No, no. It can also be seen at that one site in North Dakota that you mentioned yourself in a previous episode, so you're lying again. You can also find the geologic column at Bonaparte Basin in Australia. And then there's another site in Estonia, Lithuania. And other sites in Alaska, Libya, Morocco. Tunisia, Oman, Egypt, Bulgaria, Poland, Siberia, a couple places in Turkey, a couple more places in Afghanistan, and a handful of places in China. I'll leave the complete list in a link below. And that's if you want to see the whole thing at once, the whole, all 12 Phanerozoic periods in one place. Though you may need a petrology drill to drill out a complete core from most of these sites. Otherwise, you can see any portion of the geologic column that you want to see. Just get out a geologic map and see where the part that you're interested in is exposed to the surface and go check it out. This guy finally admits it. The Blue Earth Science book, uh, I think it's Holt Reinhardt Winston. No, uh, can't read it. Yeah, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich book. He said, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately no such column exists. If I could check the context of this quote, I think I would find him talking about the difference between the amount of sedimentation that accumulates daily being measured against the many years of that that are typically lost again to intermittent erosion, which is why it's never 100 miles thick even where it is found all in one place. But once again, I'm frustrated by the fact that I can't check your sources because they're 30 years old. Don't you have anything from this century? He said his second evidence for evolution is taxonomy, the fact that we can organize animals into categories. Okay. Cladistics, a method of classification of animals according to the proportion of measurable characteristics they have in common. The most important aspect of cladistic taxonomy, particularly in this debate, is that it's monophyletic, meaning that evolution does not allow a dog to produce a non-dog the way you keep demanding. It's assumed the more they got, you know, the more recently they diverged from a common ancestor. Phylogenetic, relating to the evolutionary development and diversification of a species or group of organisms or of a particular feature. Okay. And systematics is the branch of biology that deals with classification and nomenclature, meaning how they name them. Nomenclature from naming and taxonomy. Okay. Note that cladistic phylogenetic systematics is not drawing lines on paper, as you made it out to be. Yes, Mr. Nelson, I think it is pretty much drawing lines on paper. That's just because you refuse to learn anything or admit when you're wrong. The most important aspect of phylogenetics, especially in this debate, is that it's no longer limited to morphology. It's a twin nested hierarchy, where what had been determined by human analyses can now be corrected or confirmed objectively by computerized genomic sequence comparisons. For example, this image was produced by a computer being fed genome sequences for just 3,000 organisms, and it generated this tree all by itself based on that data. You use Microsoft Office, so maybe you'll understand that this is like putting your figures into a document and having it render graphs and charts based on that. So this isn't people drawing lines on paper however we want to. This is objective verification of what the data actually shows. Would that be reasonable? We would classify animals if they got a certain number of characteristics in common. We would probably not put the pig in with the giraffe. We would put the pig in with the other pigs. We probably would not put the pig in with the birds because they don't have feathers and they can't fly. You still don't get it. We're looking at several layers of commonality, not just at the species level, so that we can also tell which higher taxonomic ranks are closer than others. 
And since you like to point out the differences in animals, let me take out all the big words and use the examples you just mentioned to simplify this so much that even you can understand it. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song? Hopefully, you chose the bird, because that is a tiny dinosaur, whereas the pig and the giraffe are both mammals. More than that, they're eutherian, so if we replace the bird with a kangaroo, that would still be the odd one out. The pig and the giraffe are both artiodactyls, too, so even if we replace the kangaroo with a horse, all three would have hooves, but the horse would still be the only one with odd-numbered toes, being perissodactyl, and thus more closely related to rhinos, tapirs, and calicotheres. Instead, it is enveloping categories based on diagnostic characteristics. In other words, we cluster them based upon how we can diagnose their characteristics. Okay, we do that in the shop. We put our wrenches in a pile and our screwdrivers in a pile and our pliers in a different pile. But that's a one-dimensional classification. That would be consistent with created kinds. But we are talking about a multi-tiered system. Like if you had a bin for screwdrivers, it was subdivided for the Phillips or the flatheads. Or if you had in the pliers box a separate compartment for needle nose pliers. Except that we're talking about successive tiers of classification that are each several dozen categories deep and all of them interrelated, branching into myriad sibling groups within parental sets. That is only consistent with the concept of descent with modification from a common ancestor. He said, because, I'm just quoting verbatim what he said in his, uh, um, what was that word again? Sesquipedalian speech. Okay. <clears throat> because evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes. Slow down, stop. This is bologna. You got to slice it kind of thin here. Okay. It's still bologna no matter how you slice it. But evolution at every level is a matter of incremental, it means very slowly, usually subtle, we don't really see it happening too much, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. In other words, evolution slowly builds up these changes on top of previous changes. This is never observed. This is what you believe. This is why evolutionism is a religion. This is never observed in any type of life form, whether it be bacteria or insects or uh, birds or snakes. It's never observed. You are dreaming, Mr. Nelson. Evolution at every level is not a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. <sighs> Yes, it absolutely is exactly what it is. And yes, it is observed throughout zoology and agriculture. But what would you know about that or anything else? I knew this topic better than you do when I was in elementary school, and that's no exaggeration. This is my field, academically and professionally, which you know absolutely nothing about. And I can cite the scholarship to back me up, where all you have is your own willfully ignorant narcissistic hubris asserted on your own imagined authority, which is why you've been absolutely wrong about absolutely everything we've discussed so far. So, I'll teach you what evolution is and how it works. And if I ever want to learn about the heretical mythology of first century Judaism adapted into Greek, then I could learn that from someone who understands these things better than you. Acquired characteristics. <clears throat> A modification or change in an organism, organ or tissue during the lifetime of an organism due to use, disuse, and environmental effects and not inherited. Anything you gain during your lifetime, like bigger muscles or cut off your finger or cut off your hand or something, that's not inherited by the next generation. We know that. That's common sense, you know, freshman biology. <clears throat> inherited traits, according to the, uh, where did I get that? Uh, I just, oh, there it is, sites.google.com. <clears throat> an inherited trait is a feature or characteristic of an organism that has been passed on to it in its genes. Many things are hereditary. Diarrhea is hereditary. That runs in your genes. But lots of things... 
<laughs> Jeff is looking at me like, what? <laughs> Never mind, okay. <laughs> this transmission of parental traits to their offspring always follows certain principles or laws. The study of how inherited traits are passed on is called genetics. I agree. You cannot pass on something you gain. So if you slowly are piling on incremental changes, is this, is this in the genetics? Where are the examples of anything being accumulated in your lifetime that is now passed on? You stated in your first evidence, Mr. Nelson, that acquiring calcium deposits on cartilage is how we slowly change from a cartilage skeleton to a backbone. Isn't that what he said? How is acquiring more cartilage or calcium on your cartilage going to be passed on to the next generation? When you're born with a mutation that deposits calcium into your cartilaginous skeleton. As I said, vertebrates inherited an increasingly ossified version of that same structure. So there's no need to bring up Lamarckism here because I'm not talking about traits acquired in anyone's lifetime. We're talking about accumulating inherited mutations as a matter of population genetics. And these tiers of similarities establish taxonomic, taxonomic clades. And for that reason, evolution adheres to the laws of monophyly and biodiversity. <sighs> monophyly. Cladistics, a monophyla, phylo, <laughs> monophyletic group or clade is a group of organisms that consists of all the descendants of a common ancestor. Oh, so a clade is all the ones that came from a common ancestor. I would be willing to say probably all the dogs came from a dog. And as I tried to explain to you before, dogs came from some very dog-like not quite dogs. Then dogs, bears, and dog bears all came from a procyonid that was not quite a bear or a dog, but obviously pretty close to both, and not all that far removed from cats, or a line of civet-like critters that would eventually become cats, or bear cats, hyenas, viverids, nimbrids, or whatever's on that branch of the carnivora family tree. So the dogs would be a clade by this definition. By George, he's got it. That's right. He can be taught. Why don't you use the word kind? It's probably very similar here. Because, as I've already explained to you repeatedly on the Non Sequitur show, when you say, when I say kind, and you say kind, we are obviously talking about something different. Correct. Now, you are describing, though you aren't aware of it, you are describing a clade. And when I use the word kind as distinguished from clade, the only difference is that the kind begins with a special creation. So a kind will not be part of another larger kind. You follow me? I don't think the cat kind is part of the pine tree kind. I, I, yeah, okay, I think so different. the answer was, the, it was a yes or no question about whether you follow this. Uh, evidently, you do not. They don't like the word kind. Uh, they don't like that kind. He says no such thing as a kind anyway. <clears throat> I think there is. I think we are called mankind, if I recall. <laughs> Aren't we? I just showed you a bunch of clades, and I can explain how to determine them or distinguish them one from the other. You can't show me two kinds and show me how to know whether that is what they are. And since no one else can do that either, and every such attempt is nested in parental sets, then they are evolved clades, not created kinds. Phylogenetic uh, groups are typically characterized by shared derived characteristics, which distinguish organisms in the clade from other organisms. Oh, so you can tell the bacteria is different than the whale. Of course I can, but what are the derived characteristics shared between bacteria and whales? I thought in the last discussion, uh, whatever you called it, debate, uh, you said the pine tree and the whale were related because they're both eukaryotes. Well, if you can't tell the difference between a pine tree and a whale, <clears throat> come, come see me, I'll help you, okay? Can you tell the difference between a basset hound and a dachshund? Can you tell the difference between an African elephant and an Asian elephant? Can you tell the difference between broccoli and cauliflower? Can you look at the folks in the room with you and tell them apart and recognize them as different people? If you can find differences to distinguish them, does that mean they're not related? So there can never be a change between kinds and there's no such thing as a kind anyway. Mr. Nelson, if there can never be a change between kinds, how can you say a pine tree and a whale are related? Aren't the, would, you would you admit that they are in a different clade? 
Pine trees and whales are both in the clade of eukaryotes. Within that umbrella category is several daughter clades, plants and animals being two of them. So from then on, what would become pine trees and what would eventually become whales went their separate ways in a series of different subclades, but they never stopped being eukaryotes, so they never turned into a different kind. Are the pine trees in a, do the pine trees have the same ancestor as the whales? You would say yes if you go back far enough, wouldn't you? You go back far enough, pine trees and whales are related because they're both eukaryotes. Pine trees are plants, whales are animals. The earliest ancestors of each began with a eukaryote cell that enveloped a rickettsia bacteria which became mitochondria in an endosymbiotic relationship with the host cell. But I don't expect you to understand that if you can't even comprehend the simple stuff. But you said there can never be a change between kinds. Can there be a change between clades? No. In the entirety of human evolution, for example, our ancestors began many new clades, but we still belong to every clade that our ancestors did. Each of these boxes is a clade, and though they're not all pictured here, each one has multiple daughter sets. When we look at organisms born into a sister set, we begin to see that branching tree pattern. And then you said, it is a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs. <laughs> Obviously, this is similar to a bird. Who cannot see? Who can't see the difference? One problem with creationists is your perspective has no depth. Let me explain this to you one last time. It's really not that hard. Remembering that evolution is all about biodiversity. The phylogeny explorer has logged some 1,440 dinosaur species. There are a few subclades within the dinosaur clade, one of them being sauropods, like the toy you were just showing. Another being theropods, which are bipedal, like birds. And it was along this lineage that traces of pycnofibers developed into downy feathers and eventually double-veined feathers like modern birds have. And what we see of their evolutionary development in the fossil record matches their embryological development in modern birds. As we examine each of the species in this lineage, we see a definite series of transitions to increasingly bird-like dinosaurs until they are indistinguishable from birds, until the dinosaurs become birds. But none of these birds ever stopped being dinosaurs. There's an article about this, darwinismrefuted.com. I don't know anything about them, but I enjoyed what I read. Are birds and dinosaurs related? They go through a whole list of things showing, no, they cannot possibly be related for all sorts of reasons. Their heart is completely different. Their lung structure is completely different. Their reproductive, no reptiles, and birds have a hard a calcium-covered egg shell. Reptiles have a leathery type of egg. What was, how did it go? in the difference there. The reptile family tree has a deep fork between two main branches. The only reptiles to have a leathery shell are lizards and snakes, which were a subset of lizards, and they're on the lepidosaur side of the reptile family tree, and they have two chambered hearts. Turtles are older and more toward the middle of the fork between lepidosaurs and archosaurs. They have three chambered hearts as well as hard-shelled eggs. Dinosaurs, crocodilians, and birds are all in the archosaur side of the reptile family tree, and they all have hard calcium-covered eggs and four-chambered hearts. Dinosaurs and birds are both warm-blooded and covered in feathers. They have the same type egg, the same type heart, and the same type of respiration. Dinosaurs and birds share a unique system of air sacs connected to hollow pneumatic skeletons that some of them could actually breathe through. And this extremely efficient system allows for a continuous flow of oxygen rather than the hepatic piston method of breeding that crocodiles use. There is no more diagnostic feature than this unique system of air sacs that birds obviously inherited from dinosaurs. Remember when you thought that lizards grew up to be dinosaurs even though they're cold-blooded, naked, and only have two-chambered hearts? Are you embarrassed by that yet? No, reptiles have uh, a separate uh, passage for the baby to be born from the uh, uh, urinary tract where birds have all one, just one hole does it all for a bird. That's where they go number one, number two, and have babies, all same place, go check it out. How did it change, make that transition between that one and the other? Birds are technically reptiles, and as such, they use the same cloaca as all other reptiles do, and monotremes too. The only animals with separated anus, vagina, and urinary tract are mammals of the clade Theria. All other fossil mammals apparently had a cloaca too, just like the platypus and echidna still do. 
Don't whales have a separate hole for breathing than eating, and they can eat and breathe at the same time? They're not connected. From that hole in the top of their head goes to their lungs, and the hole in their mouth goes to their stomach. Birds have one hole in their mouth that have to breathe through and eat through, so how did it make the connection and separate the lungs from the stomach? The esophagus, I mean, explain this with some real science, please. If we're comparing birds and dinosaurs, then why did you bring up whales? As if the esophagus of birds evolved from that of whales or vice versa? What, what is the connection that you imagine here? Did you think that whales are dinosaurs just like you thought that lizards are dinosaurs? Whales are placental mammals, like we are. We have a secondary palate dividing our mouth from our nasal passage. This trait first started growing in Permian therapsids and was completed in proto-mammalian cynodont fossils long before there were any dinosaurs. But birds, being reptiles, and cynodonts, being on their way to becoming mammals, had already split a long time earlier than that. Mammals and reptiles both belong to the clade Amniota because our young are born in an amnion. Amniota had two daughter clades. Synapsids are where the mammals are, and diapsids are where the reptiles are, and we've been separate ever since. Yes, there are different kinds of animals in the world. He said it's a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome ma animals. How many have never heard a couple of these words before? Eutherian is the placental mammals. The baby has the mother grows, the baby grows inside the mother with a placenta. After the baby is born, the afterbirth has to become out too, called the placenta. Placental mammals are a rather diverse group with nearly 4,000 described species, mostly rodents and bats. So let's see what he said here. Humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals. So we are a subset of the same group as the bats and the rats. Maybe he is. Well, maybe he is. Now you got a point there, okay? The placental mammals include diverse forms as whales, elephants, shrews, and armadillos. Obviously, whales and shrews are related. Here we have marsupial mammals versus eutherian mammals. These have a pouch that the baby grows up in. The baby's born just barely developed, like kangaroo babies, possum babies. They're litty bitty. They have to crawl up into the pouch. Who taught them that? They're blind, you know. As soon as they're born, they hang onto the fur and they crawl up into the pouch and latch onto a nipple. For millions of years, none of them could find the pouch. They all died for millions of years. So finally, one of them left a sign up this way to the pouch. And the, the sign had to be in Braille, of course, because they're blind, you know, their eyes aren't open yet. Deuterostromia. Stomia. <clears throat> That's a Greek word, which means a second mouth. Deutero means second. Like the second time Moses gave the law is in the book of Deuteronomy. Deutero means twin or second time. Okay. He gave the law first time in Exodus. Forty years later, all them people were dead. Their kids had grown up, so he gave the law again. You can see Deuteronomy has a lot of repeats of Exodus. Who cares? Okay. <clears throat> this includes the phyla of the echinoderms, starfish, sea urchins, chordata, those that have a backbone, and a couple other ones here. Deuterostoma, stomia. Now he will make fun of me for not being able to pronounce these words because I have made a lifetime habit of avoiding this stuff to make it simple for people to, I want people to understand, not to sit back and marvel. Whoa, he knew a big word. That's not my goal, okay? My goal is to make it simple. Okay. Okay. They are classified together on the basis of embryological development. Oh, now slow down just a minute. You're going to put animals in a group depending on how they develop inside the mother. This was proven wrong like in 1874. I couldn't believe this website is still using the embryology pictures proven wrong in 1874. You think the diagnostic distinction between eutherian and metatherian embryological development was disproved in 1874? You think your buddy Dingus there was born in a placenta? Because he seems to think that he wasn't, but I was. Embryology is the science of how different embryos develop. Embryos do develop, some of them with slight but important differences. This has never been disproved. People study and compare developing embryos. People like Carl Ernst von Baer, who was an adversary of Ernst Haeckel's, by the way, 
Has even one of von Baer's laws of embryology ever been disproved in 1874 or at any other time? Of course, you don't know anything about science, so you wouldn't know the history of science, so you don't know anything about these laws. The only law you knew that had anything to do with embryology was Haeckel's biogenetic law. So you thought that that's all embryology was all about. Just like you saw an article on inherited genes that showed a picture of a giraffe, so you thought it was Lamarckism. Seriously? How can you be so ignorant and so arrogant at the same time? Let me explain the embryology of deuterostomes. You see, as a fertilized egg begins to cleave from one cell into 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on, it becomes a blastopore, so that at one point you're just a ball of cells. The very first trait you develop is a hole on one side that becomes a tunnel through to the other side. In protostomes, that first opening is the mouth, and then the tunnel becomes the gut that runs all the way through to the anus on the other side. But deuterostome doesn't mean second mouth, like you said. It means the mouth comes second, meaning that the anus opens first. So the very first part of you that ever developed was your anus. At that point, that's all you had. That's literally the only thing that you have is a ball of cells with a butthole in it. And that's essentially all you were. Just and, well, I guess you never really got past that stage. 